Um, yeah, so uh, the, maybe I should say why I'm giving <laughs> this talk. So there are, in fact, there are two, two reasons. Uh, so the first reason is that this title uh, just entered my head, <laughs> Geometry of Irises. And I mean, once that's in place, it was hard to resist. There is a second and maybe somewhat better reason, uh, which will appear somewhat later in the talk. So let me begin by showing you this. So suppose that um, I wanted to build uh, a virus. So by the way, I, I bought this in uh, at a bookshop in uh, at the university in Oslo to give it to my kids. And uh, uh, they wondered a bit about it. Yeah, so, th so this scientific university bookshop, they sell toys. No, 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 it's, <laughs> this, this is no toy. Uh, okay, I, I didn't manage to convince them about this being no toy. Yeah. Okay, let's see, I, I want to try to build a virus. Uh, so this is an, uh, this is an organic chemistry set, this particular one. So I guess that's a good start. Uh, we need uh, carbon, I think. This sounds very organic. Um, lots of carbon. And maybe lots of hydrogen. That's the white ones. So th this will take some time, but may maybe I will be able to model, model a virus. So <clears throat> by the way, in case you wondered, I'm, I'm assuming that you haven't thought much about viruses before and are somewhat green. If you're not, then you should just bear with me. I'm not talking to you. Uh, okay, so, so let, yeah, I'm trying to build, <coughs> to build a virus sort of <coughs> uh, from first uh, principles. And, and the question is, wh would, I, would I succeed? Um, so what is the, the size of a virus? So I, I think a, a rough, so here, here is a virus. Who knows what it looks like? The, the, a typical, so this is a virus, typical diameter. Of course, they come in different sizes. But a typical one could be like between 100 and, and 200 uh, nanometers. Uh, compare that to my carbon atom, my building block. Here, I think we have a fairly definite answer. It's about a 140 picometers in diameter. So this should be roughly a thousand carbon atoms uh, long, high, wide. So they are small. I mean, in principle, I, I don't have enough carbon atoms in, in, my, in this particular kit, but in principle, it is within reach to, to gather a thousand of these in one direction. And okay, now it gets a bit too much, maybe a thousand in the other direction, a million. Okay, maybe, maybe it's a bit, bit too much to actually build a physical model, but it's not, I mean, it's not too far off. So the question is somehow, is, is a virus alive? Well, what is it? I mean, I can build it. I mean, basically, I, I guess there are human contraptions that have as many parts as, as I use atoms for building this. I guess there are human contraptions with a million, I mean, nuts and bolts and cogwheels and whatnot. So, so, so it feels like I should be able, in principle, I should be able to build this. So am I then building a living thing or am I just building a, a complicated uh, jet plane or something? What, what, what is, so another thing is, I mean, these are somehow, in some sense, they are spontaneously formed. I mean, nature built them somehow. Um, and and how, so how do you, how do you go about 
more or less spontaneously forming something like that from these things. So you don't go about by just sticking a million of these together in some very complex shape. There, that, that wouldn't, I mean, it would be very irregular if that's sort of formed by, by accident. So, so what happens, of course, is that there are subunits that are more or less similar. So, so the atoms form giant molecules, polymers of some sort, and they are of the same sort. So there's the same a, a, a kind of a unit. Uh, and, and these subunits then form this virus. So how, so the, the thing, what do you need to be a virus? You need a shell of some sort and then stuff inside. So how do I build a shell from, from standard, from more or less standard subunits? Well, you, you will very quickly, if this is sort of spontaneously formed, you will quickly run into properties of three-dimensional space. So how do I, which shells, reasonable shells can I form in, in three-dimensional space? And very many viruses, the, they, they just d discover that they're, that you can do this. I mean, that's what viruses tend to do, quite many of them. Maybe you have, yeah, so here it is, with some help from my kids. Uh, so, uh, let me do this again. Here I am, yeah. So, so that's a fairly typical virus shell, a capsid it's called. Maybe some of you uh, recognize I, I have been bugging you with, with voting for me before for this thing. So maybe you recognize this. So that's my virus. Uh, it didn't get too many votes on, uh, uh, on Lego, but it did get some uh, um, very good votes, very quality votes. I mean, I, I came in, I was in touch actually with some research groups from, let's say, Sweden in the east to, to California in the west. So that was cool. Yeah, but so this is this is a, a virus. It is called a bacteriophage. Because, uh, that, so bacteriophage means uh, it eats bacteria. Uh, so this particular virus attacks bacteria rather than human cells, for instance. Uh, so it's a it's a splendid thing. It's a fantastic thing. Uh, and you see, this also has. So th this is not the typical uh, coronavirus. So this has this complex machinery that allows it to attach to a bacteria. But still we have this capsid here, which contains all the good stuff, the, um, the RNA of the, of the virus, and it manages to attach to a bacteria and pierce through the bacteria. So this is like, um, this is like a needle that can, that can contract and pierce through the, um, uh, the bacteria. And then it inserts its own RNA. Um, so this, uh, I mean, what, what I'm trying to say is that building building this thing in Lego is actually not too far away from the real thing. I mean, a, a virus does consist of, of bricks, <laughs> in some sense. Uh, but wait, I, I, it does look like this uh, here. So let me show you this. Um, this is not fake. This is not computer graphics. This is a quite a famous picture. I think it's a sort of a lucky, a lucky one because it shows much going on at once. This is an actual uh, micrograph. That, that means an electron microscope uh, picture. Uh, of course, the coloring is artificial. The yellow, the yellow thing here is the bacteria. And here you see the bacteriophages. So this is a one that's similar to the one I built in Lego. Uh, and you can actually see those that have attached already to, uh, to, to, to the bacteria cell and have begun to inject their, uh, maybe you don't see that. Uh, here, the, the, the stuff here, the nasty thing here, that really is nasty because it's going to kill the, the bacteria. So, so uh, I think in, in, in these days, like if, if you're like me, maybe we know more about I mean, we, we can give a better, this more precise description of what a computer virus is than what a virus is. But I mean, the computer virus is named for, I mean, they are named after the virus and not conversely. But we've for almost forgotten what a virus is because computer viruses are so wide known. So, 
uh, I mean, what the virus here does is that it can't reproduce. It's not a living thing in that sense. It can't reproduce. So, but what it can do is that it can attach to cells and hack the cells. So what it does here is that inje it injects its own DNA or RNA and tricks the cell into producing viruses, copies of itself, instead of, uh, of, itse uh, instead of, of, of producing more cells and more bacteria. So it, it really does exactly what a computer virus does. It, it, it hacks into a computer and makes forces the computer into making copies of itself rather than what it was supposed to do. And that's exactly what, I mean, viruses achieve this. It's a fantastic thing. And they, they don't have, they, they don't, there is no brain here. It's, I almost built this from carbon molecules. It, it's a, essentially a mechanical thing. It's driven by you know, Maxwell's laws or something like that, or, or the standard model. It, there are, it's like the, there is something that attracts this, the, the molecule sitting here that causes this to bend in some mechanism and then completely mechanically it attaches to the cell and hacks it. So it's like a robot. It's a, it, it's really, it really is a biomechanical robot that manages to do this. Right, that's what a virus is. Um, Nile. I will show you a scientific paper. An electron microscope study of the structure of some particular virus. Um, let's go to the pictures. So this is electron microscopy. They have some mechanism, these um, microbiologists, of crushing the viruses so that it disintegrates into this build, these building blocks that I mentioned. And here you can see the result after this crushing. So this is, the, this is what remains of, these are crushed viruses. And you see that there are at least some triangular shapes. And you also see that uh, these triangular shapes are um, um, built by some subunits. I mean, one can, one can see that there is something, there is some structure to each triangle that looks a, a bit like tiny molecules, I mean, spheres. They are not molecules, they are far bigger than, than molecules, but, but nevertheless, there are, so, we, so we have these geometric shapes that, that, that um, again, are, are built by smaller subunits, and we are not at a molecular level, but at least these, these smaller subunits is certainly something you can build out of your uh, physical uh, molecular kit. Um, now let's turn to um, uh, I lost the good part. Yeah, here it is. Next, next picture in the same paper. Aha, that's the virus. And that is the same virus uh, with some, uh, I mean, the, the author has drawn upon the, the first picture. So this is just to indicate that there seems to be lines going around this virus like that. So it's an attempt at, at, at understanding what you see in this picture. Maybe it seems to be this you see in the picture. Now, I will turn to Viggo Brun. The real reason I'm <laughs> giving this talk is that I know, I, <coughs> I know that this paper exists. That's the real reason. On some problems in solid geometry inspired by virology. And here he has read the same paper that, that I just showed you. So let me tell you a little bit about Viggo Brun. Uh, so he, is, he was a Norwegian uh, mathematician. Uh, he tends to be called a, a number theorist, if you have to put a label on him. Uh, but he did many things, uh, and some of it like this borders to what we would maybe call recreational mathematics. Uh, so this, pa this paper here, it's, it's a bit funny what you could get away with and call it a paper. So it's, it, this is more in the right direction of, of, of recreational mathematics, I would say. Uh, 
he did definitely much more more substantial things before but let, let's look at um at the date yes there at the bottom of the page there is some information uh, can you read this so it says that this this journal nmt so uh, norsk matematisk tidskrift 1978 and then there is a footnote on the author's name died 15th of august 1978 so this is the very last thing he did so this was really the the old man who sat in his home in drebak and couldn't resist just keeping keep going with some mathematics puzzles uh, in some sense so um i don't think this is a very well known work the reason i happen to know about it is that i have it i have the original paper lying around I just couldn't find it, but JSTOR came to rescue. Uh, and the reason for this is that actually my my dad uh, was a childhood friend of Viggo Brun, uh, but not this Viggo Brun, but his um, nephew. Uh, so there is the the mathematician Viggo Brun, who was the uncle of my my dad's friend, uh, and the mathematician Viggo Brun uh, didn't have any kids himself. Uh, so I think that his nephew somehow filled that role to some part in his life. So both my dad and and then the the, the younger Viggo Brun uh, were running in and out of his 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 uh, home quite a lot. Uh, and this was is in Trebak, where I am also originally from. Um, and uh, at some point. Uh, after long after the death of the mathematician Viggo Brun, his nephew Viggo Brun asked me if I, well, I if I was interested in in coming and going through some old papers, and maybe there was something there that could interest me. So that's how I I I, I, I learned about the existence of this paper and and grabbed a copy for myself. Now, yes, this paper. Let me let me uh, wait a little bit with this paper. Uh, he has another paper leading up to it, which is in Norwegian. No one setting it on Kuleflatens indeling inspired of virus forskningen. Uh, so sentences about uh, subdivisions of the sphere inspired by uh, well virus uh, research. And rather than showing you the pictures from the paper, I want to start with. Um, so let me see. Yes, yeah, so I want to. Uh, so he gives in this Norwegian paper, he gives a recipe for a certain subdivision of uh, of a sphere that will eventually lead us to something that has to, something to do with viruses. So here, as I as I indicated, uh, viruses all often have have shapes that are some somewhat similar to this. So let me begin with a um, sphere and superimpose this, project this onto the sphere, like that. And now I shall follow Viggo Brun's recipe. And I have only one such uh, sphere, uh, meaning I haven't practiced. And I'm a little bit nervous about how long time this takes, uh, but let me give it a go. So um, I have, cheated a little bit by preparing this. So that's an icosahedron, uh, where according to Viggo Brun's recipe, I have marked the centers of each of the edges with a red spot. And now Viggo Brun phrases a theorem saying that you can cover uh, the surface of the sphere by a certain combination of hexagons and pentagrams, not pentagons, but pentagrams. And he's a bit funny. He, he then reminds the reader what a pentagram is, and he asks the, the reader to look at the front page of the journal, because a pentagram used to be sort of the logo for the Norsk Mathematisk Tidskrift. So there is a pentagram at the front page. So let's see if we can draw these pentagrams. Um, the the recipe is to take the um, the red dots, these half, <laughs> these these center uh, point center points, and connect them um, 
every other, connect every other, so that result becomes a pentagram. So of course I connect them using uh, great circles. That's one. So let's at least do sufficiently many so that we see the pattern that emerges. Ah, I want to do more. It's quite satisfying uh, for me. I'm not sure how you're doing, but I have to concentrate. So that's why I'm not telling you jokes while I'm doing this. So uh, what's emerging is a pattern consisting of these pentagrams. And in between the pentagrams are hexagons. Uh, the hexagons, are not quite regular. And that's not just because of the precision of, uh, of my drawing. Uh, so every second corner is plays a, a slightly different role. So we have three angles that are the same and, and three other angles that are the same. So this is not quite, quite regular. Anyway, uh, in the middle of each pentagram is of course a, um, a pentagram, uh, a pentagon, sorry. In the, in the middle of each pentagram, there is a pentagon and these are regular. And they also have these triangles and they, they are of course not regular. This side here is much, much shorter. But now uh, we will do something. Uh, I have to choose a color. Let me take the blue one. Uh, so let's see. Now I want to color in the, uh, let me see if I can do this correctly. I color in this not quite regular hexagon. And so the hexagon is surrounded by six triangles and I pick every second of them and include them in my blue coloring. So I just pick one where I start and then I skip one and I include one and I include one. And this is a regular triangle, this one. So what happens now if I uh, continue? So now I, I just use a different color to see uh, the border lines. So I colored, colored this in orange. Of course, we know that I don't need more than four colors by the four coloring theorem. So I can color this whole sphere using only four colors. So I include this and this. And this, I want to keep going for a little while. Uh, so here is a brown one. And um, yeah, now I can use another orange one then maybe.
And let's do the, so this is the final one. I, uh, what I wanted to do is that I wanted to complete the picture around one pentagram. So that's why I'm not stopping. There. So let us see. Here we have uh, a pattern with um, a pentagon surrounded by three larger regular triangles. So we, we have this funny polyhedron consisting of regular pentagons and regular triangles forming this pattern. And here is the picture in the journal. Now I want to quote Viggo Brun from his paper. So he, he phrases this as a theorem that there exists a subdivision and so on. And then after giving the construction that I just showed you, uh, he ends with this fantastic phrase. Mm, uh, you can maybe read it in Norwegian, I will say it in English. So uh, beyond this, I will be uh, uh, content with the, um, uh, light-hearted old in, in uh, old uh, Indian method of proof. Look. So that's the proof. Look. So uh, let me now um, return. So this is a, like a funny journal club that my purpose is mainly to go through <laughs> these papers by Hugo Brun. So let me return to this, uh, the, the English one on some problems in solid geometry inspired by virology where again, the same picture appears. Uh, and um, now the, the question that he, he asks uh, himself is um, in, in reality, uh, these these building blocks, the the triangles and the pentagons, are as I indicated, they are built up from smaller uh, subunits of sorts. And in many pictures, so in many uh, electron microscope uh, micrographs, uh, they seem to be roughly spherical. The I mean the 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 smallest uh, building blocks that you can see in these pictures seem to be roughly spherical. So the question he asks himself is, given a, a polyhedron of some sorts built out of regular shapes like this one, uh, can I build this shape from tiny spheres of the same radius? So somehow that's what he wants to answer. So I will just accept that I want to understand this question. Uh, and he, he, as a starting point, he just gives two fairly uh, obvious procedures. Uh, whenever you have a triangle, uh, I lost my picture there, yeah. Uh, whenever you have a triangle, you can start by covering uh, each edge by as many spheres as you want. So we just divide it appropriately so that maybe I want to cover this by four edges, and, uh, by four uh, spheres, sorry. Then I just do this just adjust the radius such that this works. And then I can always fill in the middle with spheres of the same type. I mean, uh, you can do this for any size, of course. I mean, here is a small triangle. Here is the next one of, of edge length two and the one of edge length three and so on. So this is a canonical way of filling in any triangle appearing in my polyhedron. You can do the same thing with with hexagons and of course squares by just starting with an edge unit, one, two, three, ooh, four, and just filling in with smaller uh, hexagons of the same same type. You can, you can build up as, as long, as large figures as you want in the same way as I did with the triangle here. And you can do this for, for, for squares also, clearly, just extend the square as far as you want, but you can't do it for pentagons 
so as as like uh, as a somewhat ad hoc rule what he says is uh instead of doing so let's still let's still start with with um filling the edges like this deciding on the unit and then you can't now fill it in inside the plane but let's just stack smaller pentagrams inside it to form a pyramid so inside this i would i would put this so on top of that i would put, put this and then on, on top of that i would put that so then i would get a, a, a pyramid uh, pentagram so using this procedure i can just start with any polyhedron uh, where all the edges have the same length and start by filling in the, the edges like this and then filling in the rest according to this recipe he calls this procedure edge filling you could also do the same thing starting from not starting from the edges but starting from the inside of each of each uh, subunit so i fill it in from the inside like this and then do the same procedure i just fill it fill in with the smaller spheres inside so he calls this face filling so if you fill each face rather than starting with the edges uh, and then he uh, so so the the aim is somehow to to fill in and uh, and and see if you can uh, find shapes that are actually similar to 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 viruses in existence so so he, he has the um, the whole zoo to play with. Fill them in and compare with elec electron microscopes, uh, um, uh, micrographs is the word. So here's an example of what can happen. So the model on the left, I think he actually sat in his home in Drebak uh, building this with, with clay or something, I'm not quite sure, something like that. Uh, so that's an uh, icosahedron. Uh, where he has chosen this edge filling procedure and just filled in each edge with three small spheres and then there is nothing to fill in so you can you're, you're done similar for a dodecahedron here uh, where he has yet to fill in with these pyramids inside uh, and then he compares with some photos that he has found in the literature and so on and then there is a, a certain um virus that he, he takes special interest in and that is for, for the following reason uh, so this the, the the this thing on the left is something he found in the virus uh, literature and i think the, the photo on the right shows the result of this crushing procedure where you make the virus to disintegrate and see uh, and make sort of the subunits visible and these are some somewhat irregular shapes but they they all look the same and each of them seem to, seems to consist of nine spheres. So uh, th this apparently was sufficient to uh, trigger uh, Viggo Brun's curiosity. So he asked himself, can I build a uh, regular polyhedra using these units of nine? So they are called nonomers. Uh, Nana meaning nine and mer being just the, the sort of the, the, the unit. So a monomer is, is the unit. So these are nonomers, the units of nine. Uh, very confusing. I read this as no namers for a long time. I wondered why he refused to give it a name and call them just no namers. Uh, <clears throat> so I shall not go through. Uh, all of these drawings, but let me just, that they are so nice, these, these models that he built and got reproduced in the journal. Uh, here, here is the result of one of this, his procedures where he, he does this filling in procedure. Uh, and uh, so, so the, the thing, the cocktail berry or the, the olive you have in your face here uh, is the top of this result of filling in uh, a pentagons by stacking them uh, on top of each other. Uh, and what he finds in, in this case is actually that uh, the, the subunits having the same color, for instance, the, the blue ones here, uh, they actually consist of nine spheres. So if you disregard uh, the olives, the black ones, and this is actually a, a, a polyhedron built out of, of regular, or, I mean irregular, but they, are, they look the same, uh, nonomers. And,
which he claims then is somewhat similar to uh, to this virus that uh, that we saw here. Um, there is a, then yeah yeah and also he of course he can't resist to fill in uh, to fill in uh, uh, this uh, the spare subdivision that we just constructed from the from the previous paper. So here here again you see the pentagons and the triangles surrounding it. Uh, he does it also. This is the same thing, but with a uh, smaller uh, unit spheres. Yeah, so the, the unit spheres that you fill in with is, is smaller, and this is a fairly realistic model of that virus that we actually saw. That it seems to be built out of this many uh, subunits. Finally, the last thing I wanted to uh, to tell you about that that Viggo Brun did in this regard um, is a somewhat strange thing. So all of this was about um, constructing the shell, the shell of, of the virus. And then you can ask what's inside. And of course what's inside is, is the, the, the RNA and I mean there, there is stuff floating around inside. Uh, so I don't know if uh, to, to what extent he was aware of that what he was doing next had absolutely nothing to do with, with viruses. But nevertheless, the next question he faces is, can I build this thing <clears throat> in a solid manner? Can I start with, for instance, a sphere in the middle or, or a pyramid of, of four spheres, uh, spheres and start to just uh, attach new, new layers um, to, to, to the previous one? More and more layers of where each layer then is, is a polyhedron of some sort filled in with, with spheres like that. And apparently, <laughs> apparently it's possible. Uh, so I think what he has here as the core is an icosahedron. So each so each uh, a triangle just consists of, of three spheres. So this is an icosahedron, and then he plugs in smaller spheres, in, sort of in in the holes in the gaps between them, and if you fill in all the gaps, then by this is just the usual duality of uh, of polyhedra that or the platonic solids. And when you fill in all the gaps, you get a dodecahedron. But these spheres will not be touching. So he allows himself to use different units in each uh, layer. So now we shrink the inner layer until the outer layer, uh, the spheres in the outer layer touch. And then he continues filling in and filling in, and I will not go through all, all the filling ins that he, he does. Uh, but in the end, this is sort of his end product. So this is this is really solid. It is built out of tiny spheres from the inside out. And then he claims that this is similar to a virus structure that you see in, in nature. And I just will show you one of the viruses that he um, claims uh, similarity with. So this is again a, a, an actual electron microscope micrograph, one of these that I, I can't really tell from this particular uh, picture whether it's actually very similar to this or not. But anyway, that's his procedure. I guess that's actually what I um, what I wanted to say. <laughs>